Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Let us worship God. and most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The psalmist cries out, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Beloved, confident in God's steadfast love and grace, let us confess our sin. Lord, our God, by whose love fear vanishes, by whose forgiveness sin falls away, and by whose mercy our mortality is overcome, come to us who are fearful, sinful, and mortal. By love persuade us, forgiveness heal us, and by mercy redeem us. Let your word dispel our pretending, Help our prayers dare to speak our deep need. And let your love made known to us in Jesus Christ brood in our hearts until together we see you face to face. Beloved, by the faith of Christ, your sins are forgiven. May you delight in the joy of your salvation. Friends, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ as we are gathered in the communion of the Holy Spirit this day. Please do sign the friendship pad either at the end of your pew or online to let us know of your presence with us and how best we might be caring for and praying with you in the week ahead. Following worship today, all are invited to join in a time of fellowship in the Sharp Atrium, which can be found through the doors to your front right. And while there, please visit the sign-up sheet on the credenza by the front desk to let us know if you'll be joining us this Wednesday evening for our table-to-table -table gathering as we first share a meal around tables of fellowship in the parish hall at 6 o'clock p.m. and then share in the promises of God proclaimed around the Lord's table here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock. Also, in the atrium, you'll find a sign-up sheet to volunteer for our annual Easter egg hunt. Following worship next week on Palm Sunday, Shadyside family, friends, and neighbors are invited to this egg hunt on the McClintock lawn. We are still looking for volunteers, youth, and adults to help stuff and hide eggs and to help welcome and guide our guests. Whether or not you're able to volunteer, we do hope that you'll join us for this joy-filled event next Sunday. Shadyside has over a decade-long history of participating in the Pittsburgh Marathon as a way of raising funds and awareness for our mission partners. Once again this year, we invite you to run for a reason on Marathon Weekend for our mission partner, Open Hand Ministries. We invite runners and walkers of any ability and age 
to participate in fundraising for Open Hand Ministries, and to sign up for a relay team or for the full or half marathon scheduled for Sunday, May 5th, or to join in the 5K or the Kids Marathon on Saturday, May 4th. Please contact the church office by Friday, March 29th to sign up. You can gather your own relay team from within or beyond SPC membership, or just let us know that you're interested in participating and we can help set you up with other fundraising runners. Now with thanksgiving for all that God is doing in the life of Christ's church, let us open our hearts and minds to God's word. Let us pray. God, our help and refuge, inspire and renew us by your Holy Spirit, that as your word is read and proclaimed, we may trust in your presence and promise, whatever else our lives may bring, and that, nurtured by your heavenly goodness, we may bear the fruit of your kingdom. Through Christ, your living word, amen. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, beginning with the 31st verse. Hear now God's word for us this day. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, you call us friends, and you keep covenant forever. Open now the eyes of those who seek to serve you, that we may behold wondrous things. Give us understanding that we may hear your word, embrace your statutes with our whole hearts, and embody your steadfast love according to your promise. Amen. Our New Testament reading comes to us from the Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter, beginning with the 20th verse. Listen again for God's word. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. And others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch, a fearful thing to love, to hope, to dream, to be, to be and, oh, to lose. A thing for fools, this, and a holy thing, a holy thing to love. For your life has lived in me, your laugh once lifted me, your word was gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love, a holy thing, to love what death has touched. Isn't it fascinating that the words of a 12th century Jewish poet, Yehuda Halevi, so easily travel through space and time? Sitting here in this sanctuary, half a world away, more than a thousand years later, those of us who have experienced the deaths of people we have deeply loved feel the weight and the resonance of this poem in our bones. Whether the death of our loved one happened decades ago, a year ago, or even just days ago, we know that Halevi is right. When we stand at the grave, we are not done with the ones we can no longer hold with our hands. We do not simply forget and move on. There is a seed of eternity planted in our hearts, such that the lives we have shared continue to shape our own. Their laughter echoes in our memories, their words in our minds, and usually we want to remember, even if our relationship with the one who has died is complicated. We long to hear their name spoken aloud. 
We cherish the story of that time they did or said that thing only they could do or say. And yet, remembering puts their absence in sharp relief. It highlights the empty chair at the table, the silence on the other end of the familiar phone number. It's bittersweet. As Halave so beautifully and truthfully expresses it, to remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love, a holy thing, to love what death has touched. Isn't it fascinating that the words of a first century Palestinian Jewish carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth, so easily travel through space and time? Week in and week out in this sanctuary, half a world away and more than 2,000 years later, we return to feel the weight and the resonance of his words in our bones. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. It's the season of Lent, a season that began with our remembering that we are all human, mortal beings, life forms that will die. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That is how we began this season of marking time in the church. For several years now, I have tried to soften the blow. Remember you are God's beloved dust, and to God's beloved dust you shall return. And I say this, if you are among the ones who will allow us to impose ashes on your forehead. I say it this way because I love you and because I believe it's true. But I can't decide if I'm really doing you a favor or a disservice. Because during this season, not this week, but next, we as Christians will once again act out the story of the abuse and torture and death of our God. We will tell the tale of his journey to the cross, of Judas's betrayal and ours, of Peter's denial and ours. As Christians, we will and we must grapple not only with the impending reality of our own deaths, but perhaps more importantly, with the reality that we worship a God whom death has touched. In today's narrative in the Gospel according to John, the disciples entertain the requests of some Greeks, some non-Jews, some outsiders, some Gentiles. We wish to see Jesus, they say to the disciples, and the sentiment is so innocent and so worthy of repeating that I have seen it inscribed on plaques mounted to pulpits for preachers to see every time they climb the steps and presume to speak the word of God. It is written even on this pulpit, underneath the mat that makes it easier for me to shift my pages. For those of us who preach, it is a good reminder that the folks in your seats come to church hoping to hear, above all else, a word from the Lord. Hoping to see not the cleverness of your preacher nor the hard work she has poured into exegetical research, but Jesus. <laughs> It's a good thing to want to see Jesus. But neither the Greeks in today's scripture lesson nor the disciples really know what they're asking. They ask to see Jesus, and Jesus responds by saying that to see him, to truly understand what he's about and what he's up to, they'll have to pay attention to the fact that he is about to die. Furthermore, Jesus says that they and we will have to follow if we want to serve him. I don't know about you, but it's not an invitation about which I feel completely at ease. I hear you, Jesus. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it abideth alone, says the King James Version I once memorized. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. But you see, Lord, that grain of wheat has it so easy. 
What's the alternative to dying into new life for the seed? Staying safe and cozy in the seed packet? Waiting its turn in the storehouse? You see, God, the seed cannot know that to me, to us, well, this life, see, it's pretty spectacular. They're suffering, to be sure. But there are also willow trees and warm breezes. There are laughing children and playful pets who seem to gaze right into our souls. There are friends I hold dear and ideas that fascinate the mind. There's music that enlivens the senses. Oh, there are night skies filled with stars, morning cups of coffee, just the right temperature, conversations that cut deeper than the ones about the weather. Well, there are friendships that sear themselves right into the core of my heart. The seed life, for us, is one worth living. It's one worth loving, too. It's a gift, after all, a gift from the Lord, and losing it seems impossible. Tis a fearful thing, Lord, and a holy thing to love what death can touch. And yet, I wonder what it is in me that needs to die in order for new life to emerge. What am I holding on to by my fingernails that I really should let go so that God can open my clenched fist in order to receive a tender egg, a promise of something new? I wonder what it is in you that needs to die so that you can grow into God's greater vision of who you are to become. I wonder what it is in our church or in our community or in our world that must die so that we can truly live. Some among your number insist that you have never doubted your faith. I keep hearing this and my response is, really? When you tell me that, I must admit that I'm flabbergasted. I have made this faith my life's work, my vocation, and yet I maintain so many questions. In fact, my questions grow. So if you can't make it through Lent or through Easter this year without any doubt at all about the fact that what we believe requires us to suspend our rational understanding of the world, then I certainly hope you know something that I do not know. And furthermore, that you will share it with your pastor. If you tell me that you have never doubted, never questioned your faith in the God we worship here, then I feel sorry for you and I'm concerned for you. Because true faith is espoused in the asking of the big questions about what it means to be human and what it means to be children of the living God. And if you've never asked these questions, then the thing that must die in you is certainty so that you can live a life of trust instead. Trust in a God who died in a God who was raised from the dead, in a God who speaks of seeds and fruit in parables that turn our limited understanding on its head. Tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch, a fearful thing to love, to hope, to dream, to be. To be and, oh, to lose. A thing for fools, this, and a holy thing holy thing to love. Isn't it fascinating that the words of a 6th century Jewish prophet Jeremiah so easily travel through time and space? Jesus wasn't the first who had to prepare his disciples to deal with the notion of a God who died just as we must. The passage we read today, which outlines God's new covenant, is among the most beautiful of all Hebrew poetry. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity 
and remember their sins no more. What a poetic and potent promise. I've told you before that when God speaks of writing on our hearts, we should consider the ancient Near Eastern methods of writing. When God writes, it isn't an ink that fades or washes away. The Hebrew word for write is the same as the Hebrew word for cut, because writing during that time would have meant carving, inscribing, if not into stone, then at least into hardened clay tablets. So when God promises to write God's law on our hearts, our inmost being is inscribed with the very presence of God, the way a seed is encoded with the DNA to grow into a plant that bears much fruit. But let's step back a second. Let's not get lost in the beauty of this poetry lest we forget the chaos, the fear, the immense doubt into which Jeremiah prophesies. Jerusalem has been destroyed, the temple desecrated and ruined, the people marched off into slavery. Sixth century BCE. It makes sense that they feel that their God has died or at the very least abandoned them. Their God, after all, was the God who had freed their people from slavery in Egypt. No wonder they now questioned that God's power or even that God's existence now that they are again in chains in a foreign land. Into this death and destruction, God speaks through Jeremiah, through the weeping prophet. Hey, I'm inscribing my law in your hearts. It isn't back there in the temple ruins in Jerusalem. It's engraved into your very core. For your life once lived in me, your laugh once lifted me, your word was gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. Here we sit halfway around the world, many, many centuries later, And the words of Jeremiah, the words of the prophet who had first been called as a young boy to speak God's word to God's people, resonate in our bones as our society's own young people raise their voices against the idols adults hold more dearly than we hold our children's lives. They cry out against the irreparable harm we do to the planet, and we ignore them because the recycling company charges too much or because we might have to spend an extra few seconds sorting paper, plastic, cardboard, and aluminum into separate piles. They cry out against violence older than their great-grandmothers, and we take the convenient stance of saying there's fault on both sides, in Israel and Gaza, in Ukraine and Russia and Sudan and Darfur. They cry out against the weight of crushing student debt, And we begrudge loan forgiveness because we paid our loans back. Or we're never in a desperate enough situation to have to take loans out in the first place for an education that promised us a better future. And we see our relative privilege as some sort of moral superiority rather than the effect of being lucky enough to have come of age through a vastly different economic landscape. Jeremiah was brutally tortured for his prophecy. The younger generations who call us to account receive much scrutiny and endure pointed threats and mocking insults, but they are prophets, as are the generations before us who knew something of self-sacrifice for the sake of a better life for their children. May we follow suit and set an example rather than a cautionary tale. As the upcoming election season intensifies, may we set aside political divisions in the name of compassion and care for the most vulnerable among us. The God who offers steadfast love from generation to generation calls on us, as every generation, to die to indifference and ignorance, to die to all that enslaves us, to every greed which brings death in its wake. Our God calls us to die to all that would otherwise destroy us so that new life has a chance to grow. And I pray to God we will listen. 
that we will be open to dying to this seed life, this hardened, closed seed life, so that something wondrous might emerge, even as we feel the sting of the words, tis a human thing, love, a holy thing, to love what death has touched. In the name of the God who lived and died and lives again. Amen. Let us join our voices with the saints throughout the ages as we affirm our faith using the words from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Beloved, will you join with me in prayer? Holy and gracious God, we are grateful for the gift of this day, for the spring days that hint at the transition of seasons, warm rays of sunlight encouraging flowers to bloom, for rainy days that nourish the earth. May the light of your love and the nourishment of your spirit fill our hearts during this Lenten season as we journey closer and closer to the cross and resurrection. God, we do pray that your love would shower upon the earth. So many nations face warfare, Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia, many countries in Africa, India, Afghanistan, Myanmar, Pakistan, the Philippines, Mexico, and Colombia. Break our hearts for what breaks yours, O oh God. May we never become so numb to the plight of the world around us that we forget these are members of your precious body too. Grant that we would lift up our voices alongside the silenced, that we would advocate for justice for the oppressed, and offer our prayers for peace in the face of destruction. We long for your peace, O oh God, peace that surpasses our understanding. We long for shalom, the rightness of relationship with all of creation. We pray for your peace to descend upon those who are battling illnesses, be they physical or mental. Grant them healing and wholeness. We pray for your peace to descend upon those who are caretakers, from parents and grandparents to doctors and nurses. Grant them strength and resilience. We pray for your peace to descend upon those who are navigating the intricacies of relationships, be they celebrating milestones, mourning loss, struggling through breakups, or delighting in friendships. Grant them gratitude and fortitude. Precious Lord, we uplift all those who are experiencing homelessness, struggling with addiction, suffering from malnutrition, and loneliness and isolation. Mr. Rogers once encouraged us to look for the helpers in the face of these painful realities. When the call to be a helper is bestowed upon us, empower us to answer the call, to courageously step forward into the helper role that you would have for us to fulfill. Create in us clean hearts, O oh God, Renew our spirits, ground us in the joy of salvation. May we ever and always be reminded that no matter where we go in this life, no matter what we might say or do to others or ourselves, there is nothing that can cast us away from your eternal love and grace. We cling to you, our Savior and our God, and with one voice offer up the prayer you taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
be to you, O Lord our God, for you have written your law and your love upon our hearts. As we return to your service that which you have already given us, open our hearts with your compassion to the needs of all your people, and receive and bless this our offering that it may bear much fruit until to the farthest reaches of the earth your name is glorified. Amen. Today marks the Feast of St. Patrick, and so I send you into the world with St. Patrick's prayer. I do have a cheat sheet so that I don't forget the order. I'd hate to uh, misquote St. Patrick. Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord and bear God's blessing. May that blessing be upon you and upon those whom you love and upon those whom only God loves this day and even forevermore. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>